Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mary and Anneli, for helping to organize this and bring us all together. Oh, this is your second. Um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Kate Sutton. I'm a writer based in Zagreb. And um, part of my job means I have the incredible privilege and honor to be able to visit uh, biennials that are put on by some of our the organizers on stage here. Um, one of the increasingly uh, frequent critiques I've been hearing about biennials or art fairs is that when you arrive on a biennial, people say, oh, this looks like an art fair. Or you arrive at the art fair in some of these sections, they say, this looks like a biennial. And while that seems like a pretty simple and somewhat jaded critique, um, one of the things that's interested me in the divisions that we've kind of created between this commercial and non-commercial realm is that one of the aspects of the biennial that we kind of take for granted, the, the ability to commission new works and to place artist works in different contexts, also brings up um, a commercial di dimension as production uh, of these works becomes more intricate. Um, the, the sort of cycles of distribution of the work also brings up cycles of production and a new economy of production. Uh, so today, I have joining me in this discussion, I have two powerhouses from the biennial scene. We have Gabrielle Horn, who is um, the director of the Berlin Biennial, and up until recently, also the director of Kunstberger in Berlin, as well as Sheikha Hur al Kasimi, who is the president and director of the Sharjah Art Foundation, which in addition to its year-long programming and exhibitions, also oversees the March meetings in the Sharjah Biennial as well as um, offering grants for the production of work for biennials. So to counter their perspectives, we also have an, the, an artist present, Damian Ortego, who is um, based in Mexico City, but has participated in biennials, including the 12th Sharjah Biennial in 2015, the 55th and 50th Venice Biennales, the Biennale de la Habana in 2012, the fourth Berlin Biennial Biennale in 2006, uh, the Biennale in Sydney in 2006, the Biennale de San Paolo in 2006, and the Guangzhou Biennale in 2002. So a little bit of experience here. Um, his recent shows include a solo at the Crystal Palace in Reina Sofia as well, which we might discuss a little bit later. Uh, the format of this talk is we're going to speak for about 40 minutes between ourselves, just a conversation, and then uh, we'll open the floor up to questions if you have any. So I actually want to start with um, Gabby, who, as a director of both Kunstwerker, which is an institution uh, publicly funded in Berlin, and the Berlin Biennial, which is also run on, on public funds, uh, one of the things that intrigued me about this topic and this conversation was that they specified Biennale commissions um, in looking at the impacts and complications, which is actually the official title of this talk. So I wanted to know, in your experience, do you see a, a fundamental difference between commissions for a biennial versus commissions for the institution and shows that take place in the institution? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Art Basel Miami, for having me here. Um, yes, I mean, it's a totally, I, I, there is, of course, a difference in running an institution uh, uh, and running a biennial. Running an institution means that you have, it's, it's, first of all, it's a difference regarding temporality because having an institution, you plan your program like four, three, two years in advance. You have an idea for how this program goes step by step in a certain direction. And with a biennial, of course, you have every two years a special focus, which is coming from the curatorial approach and the topic and the different uh, thematics uh, the curator or the team of curators would like to focus on in a certain time, like eight weeks or maybe uh, three months. So, and of course for an institution it's not for all shows possible to have everything or all works uh, new produced. There are surveys, there are special group exhibitions, there are sometimes only single exhibitions or even only one work. That could be that, there, that it is new produced, but it's not that all is new produced, that we, would not, we could not afford, of course. For a biennial, it's always like, uh, yeah, the, the, the frame of the content and the special curatorial approach is always for, I would say, for the Berlin Biennial, but that would maybe also the point for other biennials, focused on looking to young artists, to new artistic approaches, and of course, 
is if there is if it fits with the topic and if it's uh, something where you say, okay, that would be great to have really something new produced by this specific artist, of course, then you are going for a new production. And for example, for the ninth Berlin Biennial, which we finished in September, mid of September, we, I would say we had like 90% new productions by young emerging artists, which is not for all biennials the case. Sometimes you can afford it, sometimes not. So it depends always on the discussions with the curators as well as on the discussions with the artist. And in some cases, as we were talking about yesterday, you mentioned that um, sometimes producing a work might be more efficient than trying to bring works in or have these additional um, things like insurance or things like uh, getting loans from collectors. That sometimes there, there's a back and forth for advantages for both. It's not necessarily that um, funding, sometimes it takes more funding for to bring work than to go to commission as well. So it's not entirely monetarily decisions. Uh, or how do you decide with who, how to commission works for the biennials? Um, well, I also wanted to say thank you, Mary, and thank you, Kate. Um, well, for us, it really depends on the curator. It's a conversation with the curator. And with certain artists, we feel that with new commissions, we would like the artist to interact with the city. So for us, Sharjah Biennial really is about Sharjah and having these artists discover the city and bring out things from our own history or our own um, landscape that the local people can relate to because it's an event for the local public. And if they can see something, a reference that they can understand, that's really important. Um, in addition to the local public, one of the things we were talking about um, in terms of commissioning works is also understanding that timeline and the sort of tough questions that that t uh, tightened time span involves for the artist, for the other sort of the curators, the other even things like having a catalog ready, um, those questions. So um, maybe if you wanted to say a little bit more about um, when like deciding, one of the things we were talking about with budgets is deciding at what point you really push to make a project possible and at what point you kind of hold back and see um, if maybe there's another opportunity for work. Is that, maybe Gabby, you can say a few words about trying to decide when to really push a project through. Yeah, I mean, uh, normally you have, of course, uh, a, a timetable for producing a biennial. So, and you know uh, when you can maybe go for applying at the certain funds or production funds in special countries or whatever else. So, first of all, you need to have the proposal from the artist in terms of a new production. And then, of course, it's followed by discussions uh, how it could be realized, how it could be financed, because uh, production is getting, most of the artistic produ productions are getting more expensive in the last few years. I mean, that you can, that you can see. And so it's normally the case that you cannot only um, finance something only by the biennial money. So you need always like co-producers, you need additional funds, you need additional support. And at least, yeah, it depends on the work. If it is a really, really huge work, which, uh, you, for, for, which you need like three months of installation, of course, you need to know if it is going to happen like nine months before. Um, so, but this, this is really very individual and very special. It, it depends a little bit on the proposal of the artist and then you have to sit down and you have to make a specific timetable for this work and you have to create the dates and say, okay, if for example on 1st of se September we cannot afford having the, the money together to really go in a, in a production, then you have to, talk, to think about a plan B. And you have really to think about, could it be realized with less money? Or would that mean that there is too much to compromise? And uh, the work is not that what it should be. Uh, and maybe, yeah, this is a kind of flexibility you need to have in the discussion with the artists, in the discussions with the curators, in the discussions with possible supporters. Actually, or did you have something to add to that? Um, no, I was just saying it's true because we start installing in January for March. So we have that three-month um, 
uh, early start because you never know when you have some delays and you know like we were talking about building walls and so it's good to be you know to think ahead and we've been working with our technical team is all in-house so we've been working as a team since 14 years so you know it's kind of a process that everybody's used to we know the scheduling and it helps a lot you know but you've also mentioned that there have been instances where you have been committed to a project that um, you had to had to be pulled for yeah we had one project a couple of years ago that was a little ambitious uh, but the costs were too high because they turned out to be some copyright costs that we needed to get, you know, and we couldn't put that in the budget. So the curator decided to use an existing work instead. Yeah. Um, speaking of time span, I would I do want to get to um, hear a little bit more since Damian has produced works for both Berlin and and Sharjah. And do you see how do you you were talking earlier about how you see these time spans as almost a, a challenge, a set of, a framework that you can work around. Um, do you want to um, hi, just um, I will now I remember one uh, nice some really fun story because maybe one of the first biennials which I participated was the, um, the Guangzhou biennial and uh, it, you didn't mention it and it's fun because we don't uh, always with the stress of the catalog we will be ready for the opening uh, we uh, was working in a magazine in that time and we broke the, the office we came, came in the, in the to, to take the first uh, copy, the, P, P, the PDF of the, of the catalog. And we uh, took the, the information and we print a pirate version in photocopies in different places in, in Guangzhou. And then we have a finally first the, the photocopy, the copy of the, of the catalog. Then all the artists have one, one uh, original and, and one copy. Uh, I think it's uh, the most exciting thing of the biennials, or maybe it's very specific, uh, language. Because uh, it's the invitation to resolve something new with uh, new uh, characteristics, new approaches, new materials, new techniques, with uh, all the information who you receive from the city, from the community, for the, and it's very exciting. Maybe it's the important thing in my point of view, is to be open to, to receive what, what the city is talking to, or giving to you or to the artist and, and develop a, a new um, proposal. Maybe we can, uh, as a way of illustration, you can maybe discuss a little bit about this project you did in Sharjah, which um, we yeah. see a sketch of it now on the wall. Well, it, it was uh, interesting because uh, NG Ju invited me to, to participate in the, in the Biennial, and um, I went to visit the, 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 the places, and I love the, the walls who was made in the uh, historical um, monument, and who was made with um, uh, what? Coral, coral, but they cut in layers to make bricks. And then all the, the if you can see in the, on the walls, on, the, on this, uh, the right side, is a uh, historical walls, who had a specific uh, propose, which is the corals are um, like a sponge or like a uh, full of uh, empty spaces who make more fresh the air. When, when the air comes, they, they used to put water and then the, the super really hot uh, air comes through and make a, a fresh filter of um, trans, uh, water, uh, refresh the, the air. I don't know if it's clear. Um, and then it's, it's, a, it's an amazing um, idea of technology of uh, how to refresh the, the or to have an organic um, air conditioner inside of the, of the rooms. Then I did, uh, I proposed to do this uh, labyrinth, very simple uh, structure, but made in layers uh, after a few, maybe during 10 days, takes took the, the process to build uh, these walls. With the with the proper material of the of the of the land, soil, sand, um, uh, stones, and a little bit of uh, uh, limestone, and uh, inside we put some uh, pipes to communicate one hole to another, one entrance to the to the and to another. Then you can talk or listen through the. Uh, 
through the wall, one conversation from the other side, like uh, the, the, the sound runs or goes through the inside of the wall to the other side. Then it was a system of communication. But to back this up even, before the, the actual impl implementation of the work, how, what was your research process like? When you're asked to do a commission for this biennial, what are the first steps? What do you definitely need time to do? What do you, does it depend on the context or is this a? I think it depends on the context, yeah, yeah, because you can receive uh, physical information or historical re uh, information uh, re to receive and transform, but also uh, materials, um, maybe just accidents, which you can see in, in the streets or, or different situations. I think it's part of the energy of these biennials, which is uh, really exciting. I am, I, after many which I participate, I really uh, think it's, it's a privilege to, participate, to be there. Have you ever had instances where you've had to turn down a commission for t want of time or the inability to produce it as you'd like? Well, um, not properly in the biennials because biennials are more programmed. Uh, it was more about the um, uh, commission recently in, in the Reina Sofia, for example. We planned for, for uh, uh, one, almost two years, uh, and I sent a proposal to Joao Fernandez, and we was really cl clear about, or clever about what we will show. And the time runs, and finally, like uh, one month uh, before the opening, uh, Joao called me and he said, you know, Damian, maybe I, am, I think uh, it's better to tell you now than later. I know it's, maybe it's late, but uh, better than, than later. And uh, he said, maybe I, need a, I would like to see something else. And then it was just a month. Wait, how, a month? In, uh, just a month. And, and uh, I said, OK, I will, I will give you something, something new. I will think, let me think about it during these two or three days. And I sent um, uh, two options. And he said, why not? Let's do both. Then we don't have a, <laughs> a, another money. We, 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 we don't have a budget. And the solutions was really easy. Uh, simple and really uh, fast forward and uh, I'm, at the end was maybe the most exciting pieces with a with lot more uh, challenge, uh, simple decisions okay. who makes more straight uh, the commun communication or the, the relation with the audience. Gabby and Hor, as organizers, how do you feel when hearing these stories of changing a commission a month before? Uh, <laughs> how does that sort of flexibility, how do you account for that kind of flexibility? Um, artists needing multiple research trips, things like that, when you're finding support or? I think multiple research trips is a different story because of course they're adding more research to their project and for us it's important that there is research into the city of Sharjah. So that's not a problem, but that comes out of the production budget, or how does that, how do you support that? Yeah, it will come out of the production budget. But I think creating something new last minute is definitely not something that, <laughs> that we would be accepted, yeah. Not just by us, but the whole team. Because I think during a biennial, you know, the whole team is stretched, you know, like late nights, and there's no time to, to produce something new. I think Sharjah has primarily funded publicly, yes? Or uh, almost, <coughs> what percentage is public funding? Most of it. I think almost. we try and get sponsorship for a lot of projects. So of course, we get support for, you know, from Goethe or IFA or uh, other, or even companies or French cultural institutes um, or Japan Foundation. But um, our main uh, funder is the government of Sharjah because we're a government institution. And what is the percentage with Berlin Biennale? Yeah, I would see. I, I would say 60, 70 percent is at least public money, which we are getting by the cultural foundation of the state uh, uh, of Germany, by the federal state. Um, and uh, the other money, of course, it's uh, it's also it's uh, selling tickets, so it's some income. But uh, we have like I would say normally we have like. 70 different applications to different uh, funding institutions all over the world. Uh, depending which kind of nationality the artist is, w what kind of possibilities 
are from the country where he is or she is living and working, sometimes uh, the artists are asked to do those uh, applications because sometimes it's, uh, yeah, they, uh, they only accept uh, uh, applications by artists, so then we help and then we try to get everything finished with the artists for the deadline. Or we are doing as an institution as Berlin Biennial for Contemporary Art, uh, the applications, of course. Well, I was asking, kind of thinking about that flexibility, because, uh, you know, acquiring outside funding also means maybe dealing with specific demands or obligations to meet that funding, so uh, might limit flexibility to change a commission or to pay for things like research, which might be undervalued in the sort of, in the production process. Um, have you encountered that at all, or having to kind of um, I mean, one of the things you said that you were providing residencies now to help with that process. Well, no, we've been providing residencies since before the foundation was initiated. We started that with the sixth biennial. Um, but I believe when we, a lot of uh, supporters want to know where their money is going, so they would say, I only want to support the education program, or I want to support the performance program, or music. So for us, it's really important to know where. Uh, we can get funding from people who are interested in a certain uh, topic. But for us, because our biennial is free, a lot of people want to support to, to keep it free, basically. So that's the idea behind it. Yeah. Um, one of the things we were talking about is in this sort of pressure to keep commissioning new works and to keep finding works that haven't been Instagrammed um, for your biennial, you you're producing more and more objects, but not necessarily sure where those objects go after the biennial. So um, especially when things are produced with public money, with sponsorship money, how do you, with, the, with both of your bi relative biennials, do you have specific clauses, or how do your, what are your arrangements for dealing with the works afterwards? We do not have special clauses in the contracts, I have to say, because, of course, I know those models uh, where there are special clauses in the contract, like, okay, if this uh, work, which is also, also produced with the public money of the institution, if this is going to be sold in between one year, then you have to give back a certain amount of production money which came from the public uh, institution. So, but what happens when it is sold then one and a half year later? I mean, this is, it's a kind of uh, um, trust and communication, how to deal in those cases uh, uh, with the additional money or with the public money. So for us, first of all, helping getting a, a production, getting a new production realized is also a support for the artist. So this is first of all something what we would like to yeah, what we would like to um, make possible for the artist. And then, secondly, there is, of course, the question what happens when we are giving 10,000 euros and the gallery is, is giving like 20,000 euros or even more, 30,000 euros. What happens then to the 10,000 euros in, in case that is going to be sold? Um, but then that is more that you have to communicate or that you find the really trustful way uh, to deal with it. I, I'm not sure if it helps to have everything written in a contract. Or do you have anything you'd like to add on that? Just yeah, I mean, it depends, like, like Gabby said. And a lot of times for us, because the biennial has been collecting since it started in 1993, so it's really important for us to collect works, and especially, more especially works that we've commissioned. Not all of them, of course, but... Um, that, uh, if we do collect works that we've commissioned, obviously the production cost would be uh, subtracted from that. Um, but a lot of times we create works that are temporary. So like Damien's work was temporary. <laughs> How do you feel about making these sort of, do you have an, any sort of specific feel about the afterlife of some of these biennial commissions? Do you? Yeah. Well, for, for me and I think from my, the closer generation in, uh, of artists in Mexico was a, a big difference uh, th after these years because uh, we grow with, um, uh, in a very specific, uh, strange way. Of, we don't have a budget to produce. 
and we used to work in groups so with uh, small groups of artists uh, with running our own artist space and then we create uh, we have some conscience about the production cost and then we used to work with the uh, non expensive uh, productions very uh, we talk about uh, the the fit always the the paintings which we did in, in to, to fit into the car in, the, in our in, the, in our own cars or, or easy going, like um, always thinking in, on this uh, second step. Um, and then when, when we start to receive invitations to show outside, it was uh, really exciting because we, we have some small budget and before we didn't have, then it was exciting. And um, I think it's uh, crazy just like also the difference between South America or, or, or Mexico and, and the, the cost, production cost, and also in, in, in Germany or in, in Spain or, or in France, which it was crazy because the, just to build a wall was uh, like 12,000 uh, euros. It was like a, maybe the rent of my apartment for one year. You know? Well, then, not, to, not to torture you by making you talk about the economic aspects. I just, exactly. I was thinking, you were saying one of the things you really enjoyed about working within the limited time span, span within uh, certain architectural constructs is that you get to respond to a very specific set of circumstances. Yes. So what, how do you feel about when those, that work is then moved out of those circumstances? Well, sometimes fit in, in a different context. Sometimes it's just the idea who keeps, uh, and could be just the, the drawings, the pro floor, the plans or the memory, what, what happens. But it's a, uh, uh, sometimes fits, uh, sometimes the, the piece survive, or just uh, like in sh the one in Sharjah is um, similar than another piece which I did in, in Venice. And then it's like a um, great idea to, to have um, some idea which is transforming after the different context. Also the meaning of the pieces becomes really radically different in one country than another. Have you ever revisited a work when when it moves on out of the biennial into another context? Have you ever sort of refigured it? Mm, well, just the, the if you think the, the relation with the pieces in the workshop and to to install in a, in a different in a public park in a in a in a museum always is this this experience like a, it works really different. Mm. Well, we were talking earlier about when you mentioned public money and using public money for commissions. Um, what about the role of the public, you said you were a collecting institution, but what about the role of public institutions um, that might share the same sort of budget, like in Berlin, you're saying some of this, um, the idea that some of these commissions might be able to go to the surrounding institutions or to stay at least within the city. Um, do you want to speak more? On yeah, I mean, I would be happy to find ways really to cooperate also with the existing institutions, with the existing collections, public collections, not only in Berlin, maybe also in Germany, uh, uh, to look uh, what is possible to get those new productions also in the, in the collections. So that is also a question of a certain time frame you need, uh, because sometimes those New, uh, acquisitions have to go through a different kind of uh, um, yeah, boards or whatever else. So, but I think it would be great. Uh, we produced for ex extremely for the last Berlin Biennial so many works. Uh, and when I hear that, for example, we produced a work uh, uh, of Hito Steil, and I'm, I know that there is no work of Hito Steil in one of the German public museums. And it would have been great to have, have the time to maybe go more in the discussions beforehand with one of the museums if they would like to take this work then in their collection. So, and there are other, pos there are other, other examples and I think this is something where I would like to, to work more closer also in the future to get those things done, either to get like fundings for uh, uh, acquisitions or donations for acquisitions or yeah, find ways with the museums together uh, to go ahead with this idea. Um, obviously, a lot of the funding is not just coming from public sources, but also private and in particular galleries and collectors. Uh, I wanted to know in terms of um, when you're dealing with producing with a gallery, it also brings up uh, other issues. Like Gabby, you were saying one of the things about the Berlin Biennale was kind of wanting to focus on younger artists but also acknowledging that sometimes the younger artists might be working with galleries who aren't in a position to be able to provide for these 
uh, more elaborate production budgets or things like that. Have you encountered some of those situations? I mean, this was a pretty young roster that you had with your Berlin Biennial this last time. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, if you have a pretty young artists and they are maybe together with pretty young galleries, uh, which are not that, uh, uh, yeah, not that much on the market or, yeah, like other galleries, then you can, you you could face problems when you, when you, when you are depending on private money coming from the gallery sector. So what you have to do is you have to sit down with this artist and maybe also with the gallery, and you have to find ways. And it's this is for me always like a way of trustful communication of uh, looking of other possibilities and uh, um, but it cannot be that for example you do not work anymore with those emerging artists because you cannot maybe gain getting uh, enough money together so you have to find other solutions and you have to also go in the risk and uh, look how it how things are becoming real also I, I uh, galleries supporting artists in the biennial is just very recent now. I think yeah. for a long time, you know, artists didn't have the support of galleries. So I think it doesn't really matter, like you said, if they're young artists and the work is good, then we're not really dependent on the on the galleries. Yeah. Actually, I kind of wish now that we had a gallerist up here just to kind of weigh in on that. Uh, we'll the, the question of uh, the being asked to provide for these things. We can, we can wait till the question and answers. But do you have any, as, as an artist participating um, in the biennials, do you have any particular expectations or uh, when you're approaching a new commission, are there things that are particularly important to you in terms of the organizational structure? No, no, no. I think it's uh, always different. But um, I, I think it never, never happens uh, a really tough uh, problem with the administration or with the, with the support of the project. Sometimes the gallery is uh, uh, really supportive and generous with the dealing. And it's, uh, at the end, we receive the, the piece and we can offer it or sell the, the piece. And then it's like a very gentle. I never have the feeling like a one um, really powerful uh, gallery support and, and create a bigger piece or more uh, overproduced or super produced piece in a difference than a, a maybe a young gallery who support a different I think never I never feel this in the in the context of the biennials I think it's a really fresh and, and fair um, relation I think so have you ever had collectors also help you support things for biennials, or is that something? Mm, not in my, 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 my case. Have you had private collectors help support production of works? No. Okay. Yes, we had sometimes uh, collectors help to make a production happen. Uh, maybe not the total amount of money, but uh, I can give an exp example. Uh, for the last Berlin Biennial, we produced a new performance by Alexandra Pirici, the Romanian artist. And uh, for us, it would have been only possible maybe to show this performance during the first week of the Biennial, because, of course, there were like 12 uh, performers. And uh, by getting in touch with the Telecom collection in Germany, who then really owned the work and helped with the whole production, we were able to have the whole period of the Berlin Biennial, which was at least like three months or lo longer than 16 weeks, uh, we could have this uh, uh, performance up uh, every day of the Berlin Biennial for two hours. And uh, this was something where we re really cooperated with a kind of private public collection, I have to say. Yeah? Telecom is a company and it was, it used to be pri uh, public, now it's uh, privatized, but it's to go back to the public, I, and I realize we're running out of time, so um, this might be one of our last questions before we open it up. But um, the topic of this conversation was impacts and complications. And I know I've dwelt a lot on the complications of funding and the technical aspects of production. But part of the impact is this idea that this is public. These biennials are catering to an international audience or local audience, for that matter. Um, to what extent do you take the audience into account when deciding these commissions, budgeting for new commissions as opposed to education programs or other kinds of aspects of where that funding could go? 
if you don't mind. <laughs> I mean, there's always the element of the education program. That's something that never stops. But that's a separate budget. That's because uh, we have an in-house team, and it's the in-house education team. And we work throughout the year with an education program. It's not just for the biennial. So we have uh, a mailing list. We have a lot of students and schools that visit all year round. Uh, but of course, the impact on the artist is important. So we've had artists who've been discovered in Sharjah and have gone to bigger and greater things. So that's amazing. Um, or uh, artists who keep coming back, which is also great. And also the impact on the, on the public. Um, so I've been uh, running the biennial for 14 years now, and I've seen a new generation already <laughs> um, of, of children who's, who've grown up with the, with the biennial, and it's really great to see them grow up and be inspired to be artists or filmmakers. Yeah. Gabby, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would say th this is the same, at least for the, for the Berlin Biennial. It's a certain impact, of course, for, for the artists, uh, especially when they are young. I remember we had, like, for the sixth Berlin Biennial, the whole main hall of KW handed over to Petrit Halilai, who was really a, a quite young artist, and in, in he was in the beginning of his 20s. And it was really a huge challenge for him, uh, realizing this uh, huge uh, uh, new work for Berlin Biennial. And, and it was also challenging for him afterwards, because all of a sudden he became so like uh, well known uh, that he really sometimes also in discussion with us needed to to find his way. Uh, uh, so this is of course something, but. Um, and also for the city of, or for for the for the all the audience and the public, of course. Yeah, I have an example. Uh, we did a commission with Camp for the ninth biennial in 2009. It's like the first slide, I think. And um, they worked with the sailors who, <laughs> the sailors who dock their ships next to where the biennial is, and um, they um, applied to the production grant to continue this project. So we worked with the sailors again one more time. So it's the very beginning, sorry. Okay. I think more, more. This one, yeah. So um, when we uh, screened the film, we screened it by the docks as well. And the sailors were there every night watching the same film. Um, and they come to all our exhibitions like now, you know, years after, because they know, they know us, they know our exhibitions, they know what we're doing, and they've been part of it. So that's also really important for us, that you're reaching out to the general public, not just people who go to museums and um, do that every day. Yeah. You know, maybe it's uh, a little bit naive what I said, but uh, I appreciate a lot the, the relation with the curators, but also like the conscience of the meetings uh, randomly with the other artists of the generation, which is really, important and exciting because we, I, I don't know, like uh, working for some biennial, I meet um, Roman Ondak or Hei Yu Yang or some people who... During can, the production can, process. During yeah. the production process, the, these, day, these days uh, during the installation. It's really exciting and it's a chance to, to establish a um, conversation and, and a dialogue international with, with the uh, artists, no? Well, maybe as a final comment before we open it up, what about the audience for you? How do you prepare, when you're making a commission, how do you take them into account? Well, I'm, I, maybe it's not polite to what I'm saying, but I, I never um, have the proper chance to understand people, what, what they thought. I, I think it's uh, um, really open. It used to be very different people who, who visited the show, sometimes naive, sometimes really professional. And at the end, it's, I don't know, I prefer just to take a, a, a step back and let just watch what the people is doing and moving and, and uh, thinking. Did you get a chance to watch people in Sharjah? Yes, you see some, some people. It, it was really um, playful and in some way uh, um, surprising for everyone to see a, a, a talk, talking, uh, talking to them or they talk to people on the other side, which he has established a communication with somebody who is not uh, visible for him or for her. Well, on that note, I wanted to open it up to see if there's any questions in the audience. Hi, thank you. My name's David. I'm interested to know a little bit more about the relationship between the curator and the artist. 
in particular, so once you have been given a, a spot at Biennale, do the curators um, do whatever they can in order for you to fulfil your, your, your sort of vision of your project, or, or is, is, are they, do they quite heavily influence you? Yeah. It's really great. I, I um, think after these years working, uh, it's easy to create r deeper relations with some curators than others. It's the chance to go deeper in conversations, in interest and, and complicity. And it's really amazing when to do not only one show, maybe another, and after years, another one, to create a, a career, a, a long dialogue through the years. And Always, um, it's interesting how the um, a, a good curator can invite you, or push, push you, or invite you to, to do something new, different, or fresh, or, or criticize yourself. I, I think it's really like a coach in the in the sports, or like a director in the of the cinema or a theater. It's something which uh, make an influence very generous or, or exciting. Sometimes doesn't ma don't match, and it's not a chemical. Good relation, and it's just like a um, regular show, but but it's really an important element. I, I'm sure it will is really significant. Do you guys have anything to add as organizers who then commission the curators? Yeah, I have. I think with uh, always with new commissions, it's a risk, but there's a trust element there. So there's a trust with the artist and the with with the organization and the curator, and vice versa. So. I think sometimes if you believe in an artist and their work, you're willing to take the risk. I'm beginning to think I should have opened with trust instead of uh, funding, but yes. Um, is there other questions? Yes, how do you deal with controversial exhibits and are there some venues that are more controversial locales than others? So and could you give one. some examples? Yeah, sure. I mean, we had an example for us, first-hand account, um, with the risk, of course, something, some things do happen. Um, but we had an incident where a work was placed in a very sensitive location that created a lot of um, problems within the community, within the public, um, and uh, the public kind of protested this work. So it was important for us in terms of um, rethinking about who we are. So we had to think about who we are as an institution. Um, are we here for the public or are we here just for ourselves and the art world? Um, and since then we really created a dialogue with the community. We started doing, um, um, before the biennial, we'd have meetings with other, other departments, not only to find out what we could do, but they, they also helped us locate, for so example, this location they helped us uh, use it for this installation. So we started reaching out to the community and different institutions to work together. And their response to this was, well, it's our biennial, so of course we're going to support it. And that, that's the thing that you want to do. You, you can slowly push the boundaries with works that you show, but I think if you don't have an audience, then there's no point you being there. Yeah. I mean, regarding the Berlin Biennial, I have to say we have, or we had a, a, a whole edition of a Biennial which was uh, more than controversial. It was the seventh Berlin Biennial uh, curated by Artur Smijewski. And uh, of course, we took the risk to give him as an artist the curatorship and he invited Occupy and all the related movements from Europe uh, to take over the main hall of KW and be active there. So, of course, we were blamed and highly criticized that this is a biennial which is not dealing anymore with any art, but only with like workshop projects, co collaborative uh, uh, processes. Um, Pavel Adeltama, he did a workshop in a church uh, regarding uh, uh, paintings and drawings. Uh, we built a wall uh, in Friedrichstraße in Berlin, which is a kind of as a sign of segregation between rich and poor areas. And of course, we were highly criticized. We, uh, uh, it was, uh, of course, something. Uh, but on the other hand, I have to say, it was uh, exhausting and it was uh, really something which was where, where everything was 
pushed more over the boundaries than in between the boundaries. But it was all also a question of mediation and of getting everybody in, even from the politicians who were afraid that we do anything which is maybe really dangerous or something like this. I mean, they, it was really a, a complicated, very complicated process of mediation. But I think a biennial has to take those risks and has to take those experiments. Um, and uh, at least years later, uh, this Berlin Biennial, of course, kept in the mind of a lot of, of a lot of people. And meanwhile, if there is any kind of like reportage about activism in the art, it's always like the seventh Berlin Biennial, which is uh, more or less uh, in the headline of of, of those uh, critics now from this distance. Yeah, but in the process, it was quite hard and it was very controversial. Are there any other questions? Um, just a, I wanted to add on that. Do, is there a process that, when you were mentioning politicians, is there a process that you have like a, a larger body that goes through some of these commissions beforehand um, when you're getting public funding? Or yeah, do you have a process? And when you were thinking of it, uh, inviting Arthur, did you have to go to like a board or um, other funding? No, bodies? we have a normal selection procedure, which is uh, uh, um, for every Berlin Biennial the same. We are always inviting like seven international curators, professionals from the contemporary art field. And those seven uh, uh, members of a selection committee, we ask for like proposals for candidates. Uh, we discuss those and then we ask the candidates to send us over a draft or kind of vision for the two years, yeah, uh, uh, biennial, and then we will find we find the decision. But we, of course, we had discussions for this Berlin biennial with politicians as well. But hmm? I was on that you were you were on the committee. <laughs> um, but at least, uh, uh, never ever there is the question to maybe uh, quit the contract of the of the curator. I mean, this is something what we have to uh, stay for. We have to. As the institution, we have really to go those, uh, through those discussions and debates, and we have to protect the curators as well as the, as the, as the artists, of course. Well, one of the, the polemics uh, which uh, I hear is something complex, complex about the how percent of uh, Latin Americans are inv invited to the, the show, so, so how many Asian or uh, like a, my, my minority groups are invited, and I, I, I respect the, the position of the curators who had their own plan, his own structure of uh, ide ideological or plan, and um, I, I think it's not uh, the right way just to put numbers about percent of people. It depends of the artist, depends of the idea of the curator, and, and I think it's um, is a one of the most polemic things which I hear. Which actually was one of the impacts we didn't discuss was that ability to circulate artists from different parts of the world that might not have access to an audience otherwise. So we have one last question, I think. Right um, yeah. re regarding the seventh um, in Berlin, as an American, I, I, I just want to say thank you so much because you pushed those boundaries and it was amazing. But my question to you is, would you do it again? Uh, I would, of course, take another risk. I don't know if I would do this again because it was very contemporary and it was, uh, of course, related to the different movements, to the political situation and everything else. I mean, you cannot repeat this. But I would also, for the future, I would give every, any curator, any artist the most possible freedom uh, to produce something, uh, yeah, which is, of, which is also maybe, again, pushing the boundaries. Okay, so I want to thank Gabby and Hor and Damian for joining us today. Um, I will say, last plug, Sharja opens already in January, right? Well, our programs actually started from October with the school. There's a Sharja Banyal 13 school, um, but there are lots of off-sites where there's interlocutors. So in January, there's a project in uh, Dakar uh, with Qadr Atiyah and uh, in March 10th in Sharjah. So I hope to see you in Sharjah and other places afterwards. 
So thank you all for joining us.